In this video, we'll talk about the rules for computing derivatives. We'll start with the power rule. If f of x is x to the p, where p is any real number, then f prime of x, the derivative of f at x, is equal to p times x to the p minus 1. That is to say, if you start with x to the p, then the p comes down to the front, and then you lower the exponent by 1. Now why is this true? A complete proof is a little too difficult for us right now, but we can look at the idea for the proof. So we'll start by just looking at the special case. Let p be equal to n, a positive integer. In that case, we might be able to prove this power rule using the limit definition. So f at x is equal to x to the n in this case. And f prime of x is equal to the limit as h goes to 0 of f at x plus h minus f at x divided by h. Now, what we need to do is evaluate f at x plus h and x. Well, at x we know what it is. It's x to the n. For x plus h, you just take the input and you raise it to the n power. So this is going to be equal to the limit as h goes to 0 of x plus h raised to the n power minus x raised to the n. And all of this divided by h. Now, at this point, it becomes a little bit difficult to evaluate x plus h to the n exactly because we don't really know what n is. We're going to have n plus 1 terms if we expand this, and that makes it a little bit difficult to write it down exactly if you don't know what n is. But we can make a start of it. So this is going to be equal to the limit as h goes to 0. And so we're looking just at this term right now, x plus h raised to the n. So the way that you expand this is using something called the binomial formula. We're not going to expand all of it, but we know that the first term is going to be x to the n. Because if you write all of this out n times, if you write x plus h out n times, and you multiply all of the x's together, you're going to have x to the n. The next thing that you're going to have is you're going to have n times x to the n minus 1 times h. And you get that by writing out all of these terms and multiplying together all of the x's except for 1, and then you multiply it by an h. Now there are n terms all together, so if you do that, you'll have n of these. You'll have n times x to the n minus 1 times h. Now we're not going to write down all of the terms, but the basic idea is that you're going to have something times an h squared, and then something times an h cubed, and so on, until the very last term, which is h to the n. Now all of this, all of this right here, is the expression x plus h raised to the n. And then from this we're going to, of course, subtract x to the n. And all of this is going to be divided by h. So all of that's divided by h. Now the first thing to notice is that we're going to have a little bit of simplification. This x to the n is going to be subtracted away by this x to the n. So those terms will disappear. And then what will you be left with? You'll have the limit as h goes to 0. And then you're going to have a bunch of terms. n x to the n minus 1 times h plus something times h squared plus something else whatever it is, times h cubed, and so on, until we get to the last term, h to the n. And of course, all of this is divided by h. Now notice that every term in the numerator has an h. So we can just factor out an h, or another way to say it is we could just divide everything by h. And what will we have? We'll have the limit as h goes to 0 of so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to divide everything by h. So the first term is going to be n times x to the n minus 1, and then the h's will cancel. 
So this H is going to disappear because of this H. And then we're going to have one H that disappears here, and one H that disappears here, and one H that disappears here. So you'll have plus something times H to the one, plus something times H squared, plus and so on, until finally at the end we have h to the n minus 1. But here is where the great thing happened. Notice that there's no denominator anymore. There's no h in the denominator, so you're no longer dividing by 0 when you plug in h equals 0. We now have something which is polynomial in h, so we can use the substitution rule to just plug in h equals 0. And what happens? Well, this term goes away, this term goes away, and this term goes away. And you're just left with this one term at the end. The only term that's left over is this term. Everything else goes to zero. So you just end up with n times x to the n minus 1 plus a bunch of zeros. And n times x to the n minus 1 is exactly what we get using the power rule. Now at this point we're only ready to prove this for powers that are positive integers. But later on, we'll have the tools we need to prove this for more general exponents. And it is indeed true for any real number p. So let's do some simple examples of using the power rule. So for example, we can start with f at x equals x cubed. Then f prime of x is equal to well, the power rule tells us we take the exponent and we drop it down. So we'll have 3 times x, and then you decrease the exponent by 1, so 3 minus 1. So that's going to be 3 times x squared. And that's the derivative of x cubed. Our next example, g at x equals the square root of x. So we can rewrite that as g at x equals x to the 1 half. When you write it as square root of x, it doesn't really look like a power function, but it actually is. g at x equals x to the 1 half. So the derivative, g prime of x, we just bring the exponent down and multiply it by x, and then we decrease the exponent by 1. So that's 1 over 2, x to the negative 1 half, which if you want, you can write as 1 over 2 times the square root of x. Our next example, h of x is equal to 1 over x. So again, this doesn't necessarily look like it's a power function, but h of x is also equal to x to the negative 1, x to a power. So the derivative, h prime of x, is going to be, well, we take the negative 1 down, and then we multiply by x, and then you decrease the exponent by 1. So we'll have minus x to the negative 2 or if you prefer, minus 1 over x squared. Our next example is f at x equals x. This too is f at x equals x to a power. In this case, it's x to the 1. So we can use the power rule here too. f prime of x is equal to, we bring the exponent down, and then multiply it by x to the 1 minus 1, which is 1 times x to the 0. That's supposed to be a 0. But x to the 0 is just 1. So this is just going to be 1. Now we already knew that, in fact, because we knew that the graph of this function was a straight line having slope 1. So if your graph is a straight line having slope 1, then the derivative is just going to be that slope, which is 1. What about this next example? g at x equals x to the pi. Well, don't be thrown off by that pi. It's just a number. So g prime at x is going to be computed the same way. The first thing to do is to take this exponent pi and bring it down to the front. So this is going to be pi times x to the pi minus 1. There's actually no simplification that we can do here, so this is our answer. Our next rule is called the constant multiple rule. If f is differentiable at x, and if c is a constant, 
then the derivative with respect to x of c times f at x is equal to c times f prime of x. That is to say that if you have a constant times your function, and you compute the derivative of the constant times the function, then you can just take the constant out and multiply it by the derivative. So how do we go about proving this? Well, the thing that we're actually trying to differentiate is c times f at x. So let's give that a name. Let's call it g at x. So we'll let g at x be equal to c times f at x. And we want to show that g prime of x is equal to c times f prime of x. That's, a, that's our objective. So let's just do it using the limit definition. g prime of x is equal to the limit as h goes to 0 of g at x plus h minus g at x, and all of this is divided by h. And this is the limit as h goes to 0. Now what we want to do is we want to evaluate g at x plus h and g at x. But g is just equal to c times f. So whatever you see as your input here, you just plug it into f and then multiply by c. So g at x plus h is going to be c times f at x plus h minus g at x, which of course is just c times f at x. And we're going to divide all of this by h. So this is supposed to say x plus h here, like so. Now notice that we have a constant here, and we have a constant here. So we can factor out that constant. So it's going to be the limit as h goes to 0, and then we just factor out that constant, c times f at x plus h minus f at x, and that all of this is divided by h. So we now have a constant out in the front. So this is the limit as h approaches 0 of a constant times some difference quotient in terms of x's and h's. But this limit is h going to 0. This c is constant. It has nothing to do with the limit. So we can actually take this constant out of the limit. So this constant can come out of the limit. So this will be equal to c times the limit as h goes to 0 of the difference quotient, f at x plus h minus f at x. And all of this is divided by h. So you see we have our constant out front now. The thing that remains is the limit as h goes to 0 of a difference quotient. And this is the difference quotient that gives you f prime of x. So what do we have? We have that g prime at x is equal to c times f prime of x, which is exactly what we wanted to prove. If you start with a function c times f at x and differentiate it with respect to x, you end up with c times the derivative of f. We can use the constant multiple rule in conjunction with the power rule. So here we have f at x is equal to 3 times x to the 5. So let's compute the derivative. So d by dx of 3x to the 5. We begin by taking the 3 out. So this is going to be 3 times the derivative with respect to x of x to the 5th. And we can use the power rule here. So this will equal 3 times the derivative of x to the 5th. So we use the power rule. The 5 comes down. And then it's times x to the 5 minus 1. Decrease the exponent by 1. So this will be 3 times 5 is 15 x to the 4. And that's the derivative of 3x to the 5. Let's do another example. g at x equals x cubed. Well, this one actually asks us to compute the second derivative. So g at x is x cubed. So g prime, we just use the power rule. This is the derivative with respect to x of x cubed. 
So we just use the power rule, the 3 comes down, and then you decrease the exponent by 1. So it's 3x squared. And now we want to compute the second derivative, g prime prime of x. So that's going to be the derivative with respect to x of 3x squared. And once again, we have a constant. So we can take the constant out. So it'll be 3 times the derivative with respect to x of x squared. So this 3 is a constant that we took out of the derivative. And now here we have the derivative of x squared. So again, we use the power rule. So this is going to equal 3 times. We bring the exponent down and then we decrease the exponent by 1. So this is going to give us 3 times 2 is 6 times x to the 1, which is just x, so 6x. So that if g at x is x cubed, then the first derivative is 3x squared, and the second derivative is 6x. Our next rule is called the constant rule. If f at x is equal to c, where c is a constant, then f prime of x is equal to zero. That is to say, the derivative of a constant is zero. So we can compute this easily enough using the limit definition. f prime of x is equal to the limit as h goes to zero of f at x plus h minus f at x divided by h. So this is the limit as h goes to 0, and now we want to compute f at x plus h and f at x. But of course, f is constant. So f, regardless of input, always gives you c as an output. So f at x plus h is going to be c, and f at x is going to be c divided by h. So that gives us the limit as h goes to 0. Well, c minus c is 0 over h. So that's just the limit of zero. So this is equal to the limit as h goes to zero of zero. But that's a constant, in fact it's zero, so you just end up with zero. So if, if the function f is constant for all x, so that is to say if f at x is equal to c for all input values, so for, regardless of input value, if your output is a constant c, then the derivative is zero. In fact, we don't need to resort to using the limit definition because we know that this function, f at x equals c, has a graph which is a horizontal line. So the graph of this function is just the horizontal line y equals c. So this is y equals c. So if that, this is the x-axis and this is the y-axis. So the slope of a horizontal line is equal to zero. And if you have a function whose graph is a straight line, then the derivative is the slope of that line. The slope of this horizontal line is zero. So what does that tell us about the derivative? It tells us that it must be zero. Another way to think about this is to think about a derivative as measuring instantaneous rate of change. If your function is constant, then it's not changing. So if you're measuring the instantaneous rate of change, you're going to get no change, or zero. The constant rule tells us that if you start with a function which is constant, then its derivative is zero, but the converse is also true. And we can write that down as the theorem. And the theorem says that if f prime of x is equal to zero for all x. So in this case, the derivative for all x is 0, then the function was constant. Then f is a constant function. That is, there is some c such that f at x is equal to c for all x.
let's move on to our next rule. Well, the next rule is actually a pair of rules, the sum and difference rules. If f and g are differentiable at x, then the derivative of the sum, or the derivative of the difference, is the sum of the derivatives, or the difference of the derivatives. Let's just look at the plus case for the time being. So the sum rule tells us that the derivative of the sums is the sum of the derivatives. This is actually quite straightforward to prove. Let's start by giving a name to our function. Let's call this quantity s at x, s for sum. So we want to let s at x be equal to f at x plus g at x. And our goal is to show that s prime of x is equal to f prime of x plus g prime of x. And we're going to do this by looking at the limit definition of the derivative. s prime at x is equal to the limit as h goes to 0 of s at x plus h minus s at x divided by h. Okay, so this is the limit as h goes to 0. And in the numerator, we have an s at x plus h. Remember that s is just the sum of f and g. So this will be f at x plus h plus g at x plus h. That's the first one. And then minus the second one, which is f at x plus g at x and divide all of this by h. The first expression you see in brackets here, that's s at x plus h. That's the sum of f and g, each evaluated at x plus h. The second one is just s at x, which is f at x plus g at x. OK, so what we're going to do now is we're going to regroup all of these things. So this is going to be equal to the limit as h goes to 0 of, and I'm going to start with this f at x plus h, but then what I'm going to do is I'm going to subtract f at x, so minus f at x. Then I'm going to add g at x plus h, and then I'm going to, from that, subtract g at x. Now, just to show how these are grouped together, so this f at x plus h, and then we subtract f at x, that's this part right here. And then we have a g at x plus h and a g at x, and that's this part here. Notice that we have a minus f at x and a minus g at x. That's because of this minus sign right here. So if we just find some other color, this minus sign is this minus sign, but it's also that minus sign. Okay. Now, of course, all of this is divided by h, so let's just put that all over h, like so. Now, I have two groups here. I have an f group and a g group, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to split them up so they're separate fractions. So this is going to be equal to the limit as h goes to 0 of the first one, which is f at x plus h minus f at x, and we're going to divide that by h, and then we're going to have another one here, which is also the limit as h goes to 0 of g at x plus h minus g at x. And all of this is divided by h as well. Now this first one, that's the limit of the difference quotient for f. So this goes to f prime of x. And the second one, this is the limit of the difference quotient for g, so this goes to g prime at x. So therefore, we have that s prime of x, which is the derivative of the sum, is f prime at x plus g prime at x, which is exactly what we wanted to show. Now, if we replace the plus with the minus sign, and then s could stand for subtraction instead of sum, everything would go in pretty much the same way. We would just end up with a minus sign here and a minus sign here, and then you just carry the minus signs through and you'd end up with a minus sign here. But it's the same basic idea. Let's apply this for an example. 
So here we have a polynomial function, f at x equals 3x to the fourth plus 2x cubed minus 4x squared minus 2x plus 3. It has a lot of terms, but we can differentiate it because the sum and difference rules tell us that we can differentiate this polynomial function term by term. So let's go ahead and compute it. So f prime of x, this is the derivative with respect to x of all of these terms. 3x to the 4 plus 2x cubed minus 4x squared minus 2x plus 3. So the sum and difference rules tell us that we can take this, this polynomial and differentiate it term by term. So we'll have the derivative with respect to x of the first term, which is 3x to the 4, plus the derivative of the next term, which is 2x cubed, minus the derivative of the next term, which is 4x squared, minus the derivative of the next term, which is 2x, plus the derivative of the last term, which is 3, like so. Okay, so now we differentiate each one of these individually. The first one is 3 times x to the fourth, so there's a constant in front of that. So what we can do is we can use the constant multiple rule to take out that 3. And then we'll have 3 times the derivative with respect to x of x to the fourth. Plus, and now we can do the same thing. There's a constant here. In fact, all of these have constants in front of them, so we can just factor out the constants using the constant multiple rule. x to the 3 minus 4 times d by dx times x squared minus 2 times d by dx of x and plus, well actually this this one we could just use the constant rule, that's going to be 0. The derivative of a constant is 0. Okay. Let me just fix my x here. There we go. While I'm at it, let me just fix this bracket over here, like so. And maybe this one too. That's no better. Let's try it one more time. There we go. Okay, so now we've taken out all of the constants. We just use the power rule on everything that remains. So we're going to have 3 times the derivative of x to the 4 is 4x cubed plus 2 times the derivative of x cubed is 3x squared minus 4 times the derivative of x squared is 2x minus 2 times the derivative of x with respect to x, which is just 1. Remember that the derivative the derivative of x with respect to x, that's just going to be 1, because you can think of that as the derivative with respect to x of x to the 1. So the 1 comes down and then it's 1 times x to the 0, which is just 1. Now let's just put all of this together and what are we going to have? We're going to have that f prime of x is equal to 3 times 4 is 12, x cubed plus 2 times 3 is 6, x squared minus 4 times 2 is 8 times x minus 2 times 1 is 2. And that's our answer. Well, let's compute the second derivative. So we've, we've got the same function f here, and so we already know what its first derivative is. f prime of x, we can just copy it down, it's 12x cubed plus 6x squared minus 8x minus 2. If we want to compute f prime prime, that just means computing the derivative of f prime. So that's just the derivative with respect to x of 12x cubed plus 6x squared minus 8x minus 2. So again, we can just do it term by term. But let's not write out all of the steps. Let's just say that this is 12 times the derivative with respect to x of x cubed plus 6 times the derivative with respect to x of x squared minus 8 times the derivative with respect to x of x, and then it's going to be minus, well, the derivative of 2 is just going to be 0. 
derivative of a constant is always zero. The derivative of x cubed with respect to x is 3x squared. The derivative of x squared with respect to x is 2x, and the derivative of x with respect to x is 1. So that tells us that f prime prime of x is equal to 12 times 3 is 36, x squared plus 6 times 2 is 12, times x minus 8 times 1 is 8. And that is our second derivative. Let's continue this example a little bit. Find an equation for the tangent line to y equals 3x to the fourth plus 2x cubed minus 4x squared minus 2x plus 3 at the point 1 comma 2. So this expression here, this polynomial expression, that's our f at x. Our objective is to write the equation for the tangent line to this curve at the given point. Now if you want to write down an equation for a line, you need two things. So what do we need? Well, we need one, a point, and two, a slope. Well, the point's already given to us. It's this point right here, one comma two. So what about the slope? Well, that we need to actually compute, but we've got most of the ingredients for that as well. So the slope of the tangent line when x is equal to 1, which is exactly the x value that we're looking at here, is f prime at 1. So we need to compute the derivative at 1. Well, we know what f prime is. f prime at x, we've already computed it before. It's 12x cubed plus 6x squared minus 8x minus 2. And we want to compute this at 1. So f prime at 1 is equal to 12 times 1 cubed plus 6 times 1 squared minus 8 times 1 minus 2, which is 12 plus 6 minus 8 minus 2, which is 8. So that tells us that the slope is 8. So this is our slope. So now we have a point and we have the slope. So the equation in, let's say, point slope form is y minus 2 equals 8 times x minus 1. So this is our point slope form. If we want to, we could write this in slope-intercept form by solving for y. Basically, you just add 2 and simplify. So this is going to be y equals 8 times x minus 1 plus 2, which is 8x minus 8 plus 2, which is 8x minus 6. So y equals 8x minus 6 is the equation of the tangent line in slope-intercept form. Let's do another example which is related to this. So in this example, we're asked to find the equation of the normal line to y equals 3x to the fourth plus 2x cubed minus 4x squared minus 2x plus 3 at the same point, 1 comma 2. Now what is the normal line? The normal line is the line perpendicular to the tangent line. We just found the equation of the tangent line on the previous slide. Let's just remind ourselves. So the tangent line at the point 1 comma 2 had the equation y minus 2 is equal to 8 times x minus 1. That was the equation of the tangent line that we found. And it had slope equal to 8. So what about the normal line? Well, the normal line is the line perpendicular to the tangent line. It's perpendicular to the tangent line at the same point. So we need two things for the equation of the normal line. So we need, one, a point, and two, a slope. 
Well, again, the point we already have, 1, 2 is the point on the line, on the normal line. We're trying to find the equation through this point, 1, 2, that is perpendicular to the tangent line at this point. So necessarily both lines have to pass through 1, 2. Well, what about the slope? The slope of a perpendicular line is the opposite reciprocal of the original line. The slope of the normal line. Okay, so since the tangent line has slope 8, the line perpendicular to it will have slope m equals to minus 1 over 8. So if you have a line perpendicular to another line, then its slope will be the opposite reciprocal of the first slope. So since our original line had slope 8, the line perpendicular to it will be the opposite reciprocal, so it's minus 1 over 8. Now we can write down the equation of the normal line, and it's going to be, let's just use point slope form again, so it will be y minus 2 is equal to the slope, which is minus 1 over 8, times x minus 1. And again, this is point slope form. If you want slope intercept form, you just solve for y, add 2, and simplify, just like last time. Okay, so throughout this example we were using the same function, but let's look at a different example so we can differentiate something else. So here's our next example. Is there a point on the graph of y equals 4 minus x squared where the tangent line is parallel to the line x plus y equals 2? Okay, so we want a tangent line parallel to x plus y equals 2. Well, if two lines are parallel, they have the same slope. So let's figure out what the slope of line x plus y equals 2 might be. Well, it's easy enough to find the slope. You just write it in slope-intercept form. So we solve for y. Solve for y to get y equals negative x plus 2. So then the slope is whatever's in front of the x when you do that because this is slope-intercept form. So the slope is equal to minus 1. So if you have two parallel lines, they have the same slope. So what this is really asking us is, is there a point on the graph y equals 4 minus x squared where the tangent line has slope negative 1? Okay, so now let's look at the graph. Look at f at x equals 4 minus x squared. So the graph of this function, f, is exactly this parabola, y equals 4 minus x squared. At any point, at any point on the graph, so let's say at the point x comma f at x, the tangent line has slope equal to f prime at x. So we can actually just figure out what that is. So the slope f prime of x is the derivative with respect to x of 4 minus x squared. So this is a difference of two terms, so we can differentiate it term by term. So this is the derivative with respect to x of 4 minus the derivative with respect to x of x squared. Well, the derivative of a constant is 0, and the derivative of x squared is 2x. So this is 0 minus 2x, or negative 2x. So that tells us the slope 
of the tangent line at x comma f at x is f prime of x equals minus 2x. Then the question becomes, is there an x value for which f prime of x is equal to negative 1? Well, really what that means is negative 2x equals negative 1. And of course there is, x equals 1 half. So is there a point on the graph where the tangent line is parallel to the line x plus y equals 2? And the answer is yes, it's when x is equal to 1 half. So x is equal to 1 half, and y is equal to f at 1 half, which is equal to 4 minus 1 half squared, which is 4 minus 1 fourth, which is equal to 15 over 4. So then the point that we're looking for has coordinates x comma y, which are 1 half comma 15 over 4. And this is the point that we're looking for. And that's our answer.